Welcome to the Calgary Sessions. This is episode number 89. I'm your host, Jeff Humphreys. Today's guest, um, this is going to be a fun one for me because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell the true story of how this happened. I went, we both went to this event and um, Connor was hosting this event. It's like beers and it's like this community builder. And I hate these things. I never, <laughs> I never go to these things ever, ever, ever. My good friend Mike Clausen was going, so I'm like, okay, I'll go with him. Mm-hmm. And part of this event was you had to get up and like say your thing yeah. in like a minute, introduce yourself to 80, 80 some odd people. A- and I hate doing that also. So anyways, get up, say what I'm doing. I'm like, ah, I got a podcast and interview cool, cool people in Calgary. This guest gets up and says who she is. And I was like, oh, I'd like to meet her. <laughs> Me being an introvert and hating these environments would not come find you. Oh, I didn't know that. And, and, I, I, was and, I, was, busy. and I was hanging out with my buddy in the back corner drinking beers. So that's what happened, and here we are. So then I was like, I, I need to connect with her. So anyways, shoot you a message, and then this is how it is. So uh, please go ahead, name, and who you are. Yeah, so I'm Kata Lemon. I'm now the president and co-owner of Redpoint Media. So I think when we actually met, I was the president, but I wasn't yet mm. a co-owner, or maybe I had I just you, become. I, I, think, I think you were. I just became. Yeah, so yeah, just. this is almost, I think it's six months ago today, actually, oh, no that way. Um, my business partner, Roger Jewett, and I bought Redpoint Media. So I've worked for Redpoint, which is probably best known in Calgary for being the publisher of Avenue Magazine. Mm-hmm. I've worked for Redpoint for 17 years. Um, and then just came on as um, a, my first foray into being an entrepreneur. So, which is so cool. Yeah. And I think that's what be that's where this would be a fun conversation. You know, just actually, people tend to see the highlight. They see like the end. They see where someone mm. got. And I think what'll be interesting about this conversation is like there's 17 years behind this story, and then plus more behind that. Yeah. <laughs> to get to this point, so I think that'll be really cool because. Um, a lot of people don't understand those or don't, they don't get the opportunity to hear those stories. Yeah. And certainly, I mean, this is not the end point. This is the very beginning of mm-hmm. the journey of, of taking Redpoint into a, the next part of its story. So the company's almost 30 years old. It'll be 30 years in uh, next December, so a year, December 2024. Cool. Um, and so it's pretty exciting to be mm-hmm. part of it. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've seen a few of these. Yeah. So I like the guests to go back as far as they want to go. And me not knowing anything about you, this is the oh. coo- this, this is the coolest part about the yeah. show because I have no idea where you're born, how you grew up. Yeah. So just take it back. Um, you know, inspiration, what you're into, into as a youngster. You know, who influenced you, and just go back as far as you want to go. Uh, well, I was born in Ontario in a town called Kincardine, which is on Lake Huron, just south of Georgian Bay. Um, lived there till I was eight. Uh, my parents split up when I was really little, so just after my sister was born, yeah. I had one younger sister, um, and. Then we moved around a little bit, um, Woodstock, Ontario, the dairy capital, and then London. And then I went on student exchange to Japan. And while I was in Japan, my mom and my sister moved to Vancouver. So I finished high school in Vancouver. Um, Where was the student exchange? How old were you? uh, I think I... I think I was 16. Okay. Um, it was like the like grade 11. Yep. Um, and I was in Japan. So just outside of Tokyo in Mm. a town called Tokorozawa. Um, had a great experience. It was fantastic. Um, Rotary Student Exchange, fantastic program. Yeah. Just like great idea to share culture, share opportunities. Students get to go. Um, you know, I went and lived. I think I lived with six different families over oh, cool. the course of the year. Uh, almost couldn't get more different from the experience I'd had up to that point in my life. Um, Why? What was the pull? Like I can imagine. Like what? What life? What? <laughs> what life look like at home? And then all of a sudden going. To that kind of, like, that far across. Yeah, I mean, I was really lucky. My aunt and uncle were really involved with uh, Rotary. Mm. And so they had had Rotary Exchange students. They'd hosted Rotary Mm. Exchange students. And so I saw these students come and stay with them and have these incredible opportunities from all over the world. I can't remember if they had a Japanese student, but they'd had, you know, Swedish students and they'd have, they'd hosted a number of different students. And so then when I was the age... A, I knew about the opportunity. I knew that Rotary did this and that you could apply and that if you got in, you got to go to another country. Um, And that was like, that seemed interesting to you? Like traveling traveling the world, like getting out of where you were? Absolutely. Absolutely. Seemed fascinating. Like, yeah, definitely. And I think I knew, like there's not going to be a lot of times in your life where you have that experience. Like you can't, as an adult, you can't do, you don't get invited into six different families' yeah, homes to yeah, just yeah. live with them for a year. Yeah. Um, so it was a very different type of travel. Um, but I didn't, it's funny, I didn't initially want to go to Japan. It wasn't my first choice. And it was really funny. So it's like, 
at that time, I can't even remember what year that would have been, like 94 maybe, <laughs> um, you had to type in this form in triplicate. And so it's like, you know, the top form and then you type, you have to type really, really hard so that it goes all the way through the carbon paper and stuff. And I just finished filling it out and the country that was my top pick was um, India. And okay. basically, as soon as I filled in the form, um, there was this news that came out of India that there was like an outbreak of the bubonic plague, right? And my parents were like, absolutely, you're not going to India. They have <laughs> literally the plague, um, which I'm sure blew over fast and was, you know, there's modern medicine, obviously. But um, they were like, no, change it. And I was basically too lazy to fill the form in again. Mm -hmm. And so I just whited out, like, I think Japan was my, like, 11th oh, choice. And so I made Japan number one and made India number 11. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, was it? very lazy. And they kept telling you, like, you won't get your first choice. Mm -hmm. you, you know, yeah. that's why you had to fill this huge form in in, like, 20 countries or something. And you had to rank them. So I was like, it doesn't matter because I won't get my first choice anyways. And then and they were like, you're so lucky you got your first choice. Like, but it was, it was a really great place to have that opportunity. And really, honestly, anywhere would have been fantastic because yeah. you just get that you get outside of your comfort zone and mm -hmm. it's a very different type of travel experience than you can have at any other time in your life. Do you, like, I don't travel. I've never, I've never had the travel bug. I've never had this like desire to go, you know, once you're there, what is it? Is it just like being self-sufficient? Is it just like experiencing things? It's just like opening your mind to think differently. Like, what do you For think? me, it was, yeah, opening my mind to think differently. And, and certainly, like I said, it's no other travel is quite like that. So you're definitely not really self-sufficient yeah. because you're inside a family. You're very, you're looked after, you're, everything's done for you. Um, but it's that, I think that opportunity to see that life can be different. Mm -hmm. Like all the things that we assume, oh, let, things are this way. And it's like, well, they don't have to be. Mm. They don't have to be that way. Mm. Um, this other group of people seem to be doing perfectly well, not doing things this way at all. Yeah. Um, and and it, I think for me, especially at that time in my life, it opened up that that pos There's so much more possibility mm. than what I've been just yeah. what I've already seen. And what and what you had been seeing, mm -hmm. just typical normal. Yeah, pretty normal. Like I have a a really. Um, close extended family. So I have um, aunts and uncles and cousins and not a huge family, but, um, yeah. you know, great, mm -hmm. great group. Like yeah. I was, I've been very, very lucky in my life. My family is fantastic and um, very supportive. And like I was raised by a single mom, but my extended family on both sides, yeah. you know, helped with all those things that I think a lot of single parents can't provide for kids. So I got swimming lessons in summer camp and, mm -hmm. you know, took violin lessons and got to go on Rotary Student Exchange. So I got all these things that I think maybe I wouldn't have gotten if it had just been yep. my mom trying to provide all this stuff for us because it just wouldn't have been possible. Right? Yep. Yeah, if the family, if, you, if your extended family was in a different province or just like... Yeah, and we were, everybody was in Ontario. Um, everybody was fairly close together. Mm -hmm. um, more spread out now, but like at that time when I was growing up. Yep. Yeah. Um, so what happened when you get back? So you're, that, that's grade 11? Yeah. Is so, it all year? Uh, it was a full year. Okay. So like August to August, I think it was. And then we ca I flew back into Toronto and my mom picked me up and we drove... <laughs> Out to Vancouver. No way. Uh, and um, just have, two of you. No, it was and my sister. sister okay. My sister too. So yep. we drove, and I couldn't drive at the time. I didn't know how to drive yet. So it was my mom driving the whole way. Crazy. And she was just like, "Oh my god." Do you remember the trip? Yes. Like, do you remember like all the pit stops and like any? Yeah. yeah. And I remember my sister and I still laugh because my mom would be like, you know, we she'd make us go see these things. Like I remember we went into this like <laughs> amethyst mine in I think in Sudbury, and it was like. Uh, yeah. Like which amethyst mine, it turns out that an amethyst mine is basically just a big field of mud <laughs> with some amethyst in it and you go and you pick through. Like, <laughs> Sounds awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Canadian tourist attraction. Yeah. Uh, so and my mom would always be like, you know, you got to get out. This might be the only exercise we get all day. Mm -hmm. And so we'd always you get out and wander around and look at the, you know, whatever. Yeah attraction was it yeah. amethyst mine or a waterfall or some sort of historic plaque and yeah. um you know did that the whole way and we went the we took the ferry so we went from we left from Kincardine where I, where I was born and went and took the ferry across 
um, Lake Huron and went up um, around the lakes that way. Cool. Yeah. Um, so you're for grade 12, you started yeah, so grade 12 in Vancouver? Grade 12. And it was a mess because, um, like I was, I'm old enough that I would have had grade 13 in Ontario. Oh, yeah. So I was going into grade 13 mm. and the school systems did not line up at all. So there were all these things that I had to do that were like grade nine credits mm. that I had to do in grade 12, yeah, yeah. but I was an, a year older mm -hmm. even than the grade 12 students. Mm. And so there was all this stuff that I was just like, oh. It was a mess. <laughs> it was a mess. And like the, the system worked very differently. Like Ontario didn't have uh, provincial exams. So mm. there, I didn't understand that there were some courses that counted yep. in different ways than other courses mm -hmm. and got halfway through the, or not halfway, but like after Thanksgiving where, you know, you go around and you talk to the different universities come and talk to you about what's going to be. And they were like, you can't go to university. It's like, what do you mean? <laughs> Like, well, you don't have the credits to go to university. Crazy. And I was like, well, that, that can't happen. <laughs> like, we got to fix this. And so it was like fit quick, fast, partway through the year, had to add on, it was like physics and geography or something, oh, you know, easy stuff. Uh, so uh, added those on, managed to graduate and go to university. So I went to UVic. That, um, going to a new school, new province, new city in grade 12. Yeah. I was not my best version of myself. And I, I can't, I can't, like, that'd be, it's intimidating. It's just yeah. like, there's a lot of emotions going on at that time. Yeah, day. yeah. Anyways, right? Yeah. And uh, and my mom, we had moved to Vancouver because my now stepdad was doing a PhD in Vancouver at Simon Fraser. Okay. Um, so again, like, add in that change in family dynamic. And yeah, mm. I wasn't, I wasn't at my best a lot, <laughs> as a, a human being. There was a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, but you actually got into university? Like, got into you, university. Were you um, like a capable student? Like school, yeah. school wasn't like yeah. a problem for you? No, not at all. It was something, um, yeah, it came naturally to me. Like it was, it yeah. was pretty easy. There were things that I was like, I don't really enjoy. Yeah. I, I wasn't great in math, but I was okay. And yeah. like picked up physics. So I did okay. Even, even uh, in like the, even as you're not your best version of yourself, you can still like keep it together and actually... Well, keep partly on, too, I didn't, I mean, I didn't have a lot of friends, right? Right. My last year of university or last year of high school, I went to a very, very small school mm. in Vancouver. So didn't really have anything else to do, but yeah, it was academically, academics were, came fairly easy to me. Mm. Uh, so what'd you take it? I have a BFA in creative writing okay. with a minor in professional writing, which is always a bit of a kick in the pants where you're like, mm. <laughs> your minor is in professional writing. Like here's your major is in, you know, nothing much worth talking about, but your minor is in what might make you <laughs> some money. Uh, and then I went from there to do a master's uh, at uh, what's now uh, Metropolitan Toronto University or mm. Toronto Metropolitan University, yep. um, and that program was in. It was called uh, Communication and Culture. Okay. So, what was the pull into those into that field? Like, come out of high school, what's the pull to get into that stuff? It sounds yeah. very. Yeah. I mean, I again, I liked writing. I liked um, creative. I thought I was going to be a novelist. Right. No I was like, oh yeah. Like, like as if writing? there's like a lot of like jobs mm -hmm. out there being a novelist. Um, but you know, my mom was a, was a painter, um, a fine art painter. And so I think that that possibility that you didn't have to go into mm -hmm. something that was going to result in a job, yep. um, or that you could do things that you were like, your vocation and your job don't necessarily need to be the same thing, right? Yep. That you can be a novelist, but you're actually teaching or yep. you're actually doing some other thing that makes you money. Hmm. That was something that I was raised knowing. Uh, was that like a like a sit down lesson, or was that a lesson that you just kind of? Figured well, like out all watching? the people around my mom, especially, um, didn't really have like career jobs. Mm. They didn't really. Most of them were artists and you know painters and sculptors, and they maybe did some graphic design. Like they had some other job, but they're like thing that they did was not a nine to five mm. thing necessarily. Yep. Um, so I think it just came through that. And um, like, obviously I knew like my uncle's a, now he's a judge, but at the time he was a family lawyer. Um, and I think too, part of it was that when I looked around at a lot of the people that I knew who had more typical nine to five jobs, 
they didn't necessarily seem happier than the people who were either entrepreneurs or had more creative jobs. And and my grandparents on both sides of the family had run hotels, Mm. right? So again, it's like not even when you're like, well, it's a kind of, you know, hotel manager, it's a job. But if you own the hotel, you kind of just work all the time on the hotel and you're constantly thinking about it. And that that didn't seem bad. Mm. That seemed like, okay, well, there's all sorts of different ways that you can cobble together Mm. a living. Yeah. Did you understand that early? As a, as a, a I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to know what you kind of like project yeah. back onto your childhood. Yeah. You're like, oh yeah, I always knew that. Yeah. Uh, but it was always like when I look back, I can I can identify that that was always around that mm-hmm. concept. Because the writing piece, like, were you writing a lot in high school or junior high? Like, just things? Yeah, or? I think so. And like, I run, I won a like playwriting competition in the seventh grade and things mm-hmm. like that. So there was also these. You know, I got. Um, recognized for some of that stuff early on and that then yeah. feels good and you yeah. keep doing it, right? Yeah, it gives you some... It's interesting just to hear you talk about these, like seeing these other opportunities of how to go down, like not the tradi- traditional like lawyer, engineer, yeah. accountant, like all that. Well, like I remember when I... So when I was finishing my undergraduate degree and I was like, I know I need something else. Like this wasn't enough for me. Um, and I talked to my uncle who was a lawyer and was like, maybe I should go into law and like maybe, you know, like copyright law. And he was like, no, you should not do that. <laughs> that will not work out for you. Um, so I think that kind of part of it too, of having people who were like, yeah. you know, not everybody is going to make it in everything they try at, but that's equally true of more traditional jobs too. Like not everybody who gets an engineering degree becomes an engineer Mm -hmm. and not everybody who becomes a writer or takes a writing degree becomes a writer. But if that's the thing that you want to do, this is the time to try it, Mm. right? Like Mm -hmm. when you're young and you don't have a mortgage and you don't have a bunch of people relying on you. (laughs) Good point. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So you you fly, then you go back east. Yeah, went back to Toronto. Just because, um, like, that's where the program or the program you were interested in was offered, or did you want to get back out east? I think I applied to a few different schools. I can't really remember now. Um, and same with my decision at UVic. I, they offered me the most money. UVic offered me a scholarship. Uh, Ryerson offered me a scholarship. I'm, I'm in. Go You're going to pay me to go? I'm, I'll be there. Uh, academic, academic scholarships? Yeah. Okay. I thought you were going to pull I'm not, out. I'm not you, much, I'm not out, much like, of a sports. I was a diver. No, I thought you were going to do no, something. No, 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 <laughs> no. I, I mean, I did stuff, but I, I yeah. did it to be part of the yeah, yeah. thing, not so much to be like I was the top, uh, mm-hmm. you know, track yeah. athlete. <laughs> yeah. I was the bottom track <laughs> athlete. Somebody has to come in last, fill out the ranks. <laughs> totally. That was me. Um, so anything happened in Toronto? Was Toronto a thing, like taking your finishing your schooling there? Was there any, like, um, big takeaways from being there? Or was it? Yeah, I mean... It's funny too, looking back, I think so much of what we have as our narrative is stuff that we put onto it after. So it's hard to say, but um, I had a great time, um, loved it there. And I assumed at the time that I would stay in Toronto um, because that's where publishing was, right? Like mm. that's where publishing was and is in Canada is yep. mostly out of Toronto. Um, most magazines are in the country are are published in Ontario, primarily in Toronto, Uh, and had some really great experiences. I worked for a publication called Outpost, which is an alternative travel publication. And while I worked there, we won Magazine of the Year, Canadian Magazine of the Year. So, you know, pretty nice to get that in your back pocket. Um, And then my now husband was living in Calgary. So when I graduated from Ryerson, it was like, well, you should come here because I already have a job and you don't have a job. So... That was pretty good logic. Uh, so that was in 2004. Okay. And at that time, I was like, I'll give it one year. Mm. So that was uh, almost 20 years ago now. Crazy. Yeah. Um, were you, when you're in Toronto, like your, your personality, was it like... Was <laughs> Did it, I have a different personality you, in Toronto? No, what, what, like, you know, when you're, you know, you're coming out of high school and, you know, you're trying to figure, figure things out. Yeah. Now you're at a point in your life, is it like introvert, extrovert, confident, you know, just like, is there any, is there any like, I'm a pretty confident person. I'm pretty extroverted. Um, I find it pretty easy. Not, I mean, not, there's always times you go into a new social situation and you're like, I don't know anyone here. Um, 
But I find it pretty easy to strike up conversations with most people. I find it pretty easy to um, insert myself into a crowd. Uh, It's one of the things that I'm... I am pretty good at. Um, And I think partly, you know, a lot of times it's that skill that gets you into all sorts of places that you never know. Like I I have a friend who always jokes because I'm like, oh, I went to this conference and then I met the conference, um, you know, organizer. So then I got to go to the speaker's dinner. So then I got to meet this person because it's just like you just you're chatting with people and um, open and generous with your own curiosity. I think often you find... um, especially at things like conferences, you, mm. you find people who want to talk about the things that you already want to talk about. For so. sure. That curiosity piece is an interesting, I don't, I, I don't give that much thought ever. To, to actually, curiosity? Yeah. Like, yeah. Like to actually be in a, to be in a room or an environment and be curious about either the people in there yeah. or like. Well, like you said, I think, you know, when you said, oh, I had this person, I met this, I met her at this event and then I didn't know what to say. And it's like, usually I think what most people find interesting in a conversation is when someone else is interested in them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you can almost never go wrong by going up to someone and being like, hey, I heard you say this. Could mm-hmm. you tell me more about that? Yeah. Um, but again, I, I know of myself that that's easier said than done for some people. Mm-hmm. So for myself, that is, that is a fairly easy thing to do that yeah. I am just naturally curious about like, so how, how are you doing? Mm. How did you get the idea for the Mm -hmm. podcast? Mm -hmm. Tell me about Mm -hmm. your company. Tell Mm -hmm. me about who was the first person you called and like those types of things. And following that curiosity, I think is a big part of what I do. Mm -hmm. It's interesting because that curiosity idea is, it's such a, um, has nothing to do with you. You know, it's not, it's not, I think some people when they get awkward, they become like self-focused. Yeah. And so they put that in a group and it's kind of awkward because it's like self-serving conversation. And yep. It's like, but the curiosity piece is like this, um, it's like a conversation starter and it's like. Yeah. Tell me about you. Mm-hmm. Right. And, and there's, there's certain times where that can feel like an interrogation, which yeah. isn't friendly. Yeah. Whereas if it's more curiosity fueled and just like, oh, tell me more about that. Like, yeah. where did that, mm-hmm. how'd you get involved in that? And yeah. why that? thing and Mm -hmm. where'd that lead you to Mm -hmm. like so all this stuff that you're doing with this right it's curious like tell me about like Mm -hmm. where do you come from how did that get you where you are what do you think about this um it's just following that that curiosity i think Mm -hmm. for a lot for writers if you don't have that natural curiosity i don't know how you like it's got to be a slog partly because it's like following your curiosity it's in and of itself a reward, right? How, it's an intrinsic reward of, of so much of the position that I was in as the editor of Avenue um, was just being able to like, it gave you a reason to be able to ask people yeah. questions and yeah. to be able to ask them almost anything. And that if they said no, you were like, oh, you said no to Avenue. Like you didn't say no to me. Like, so it, <laughs> I'm not gonna take that personally. And like, yeah. you know, there's all sorts of things too that, you know, we've talked a lot about, we, when we do stories in the magazine about um, home decor, we would always want the person to talk about, like, yeah. tell me about why this home is great for you. And we, yeah. they don't, we don't require the people to be in the photos, but we like it, but we do require them to be named in the story. And there are a lot of people who are like, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to be in that. And it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, I totally get that. Mm-hmm. But then that's not the story we're telling. We're yeah. just telling the stories about people, yeah. not rooms. Yeah, things, <laughs> totally. Um, so 20 years ago, almost yep. you moved to Calgary, moved to Calgary, give it and you, and you're coming under the 12 months. I'm giving this 12 months yep. and if, and then we'll make a decision after that. Yeah. And I think, I think you always, you can live anywhere for 12 months, Well, right? Like you can live any, and, it, and if you don't really give a place at least 12 months, you don't really know it. Right. Like I feel fair. like that's, you have to, you have to give it a full, yeah. Full, like for all the seasons. Luck. Yeah. And I think, but there was never, there was, you know, it wasn't like we got to 12 months and I was like, well, maybe another 12 months. It was like very quickly that I was like, this is, I love it here. This mm. is a great, and I had so many opportunities early on, um, that just led to more and more opportunities. Yeah. And those opportunities, how did they like, you moved to a city. So here's, 
So I was lucky, right? Because I moved here. My husband, Tyler, is his family was here. Mm. So, and I was really lucky. Like, so his uncle, um, Ted Hellard, owned Critical Mass at the no time. Um, so I, he was working there. Um, Who's your husband? Tyler Hellard. So not Ted's son, Tyler. Um, but so Tyler has, you know, been working in digital marketing for mm-hmm. 20 years. Was he at Critical Mass? He was at Critical Mass. For a long time, so, and then he was at Rare Method, okay. and then he was at um, Zoo Media, and then App Colony, <laughs> and Crazy. then yeah, so all over the place. And the only reason I'm asking is because I worked at Critical Mass in 2001, and then I went back in 2000, okay, so and then I went back in 2006. Okay, so he would have been so there, I, I think, I'm, that whole time. Yeah, so I would have. I <laughs> so he worked on Dell. He yep. worked on, yeah, yeah. Uh, and his dad worked there too. So his dad was the, um, what was he? he was like the dealer representative for Mercedes. So mm-hmm. we kind of, kind of always joke because Ron was like the dealers, right? Like he was mm-hmm. a guy and he was mm-hmm. like late, I guess he would have been in his maybe late 50s at and the time. Funny. And he was like, you know, he was just very like yep. golfed and yep. he was like that kind of guy. So it was really easy for him to talk cool. to the dealers. Yep. Less easier for him to talk to some of the other employees <laughs> at Critical Mass. But so I was really lucky. And I at, I didn't I worked at Critical Mass, but very, very briefly. I was mm. there for about four months. It wasn't a fit for me. Yep. Uh, and there was no career path for the position that I was in. So I was a copy editor mm-hmm. hired on the Mercedes website. Mm-hmm. Uh, I got to make really exciting uh, decisions like is cup holder one word mm-hmm. or two words, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. ensure that formatic was properly written in every instance. So it was like not really something that I could sink my teeth into and feel like, yeah, it's worth me getting up in the morning and yep. coming and doing this, That's which, fine. you know, they do a lot of really great work, but the copy editing piece of that yeah. was not super exciting. Yeah, th- there was so many, the place, when I was there, my first tour through as a production artist. Mm. So similar to like you deciding yeah. of like taking a word into two. Yeah. I was taking a graphic yeah. and tracing out all yeah. the elements so that a programmer could like, then take. Can you, can and then, you make this shadow sexier? Yeah. Like, no. So, that, so my, my, feel, my <laughs> feeling is the same way, right? It's just, it, it exposed me to a bunch of interesting characters. I, you know, the people there, that would have been the reason that I would stay. Yeah. The people were great. Yeah. I, I, like, again, great corporate culture, but the work in and of itself was not exciting to me or for me. Yeah. Um, so I, I stayed there for about four months and yeah. went to the dentist and quit. <laughs> and so that was, you know, I was young at the time too. Yeah. I was just out of university. And um, so from there, I was able to get a job at Alberta Views magazine. Mm-hmm. And from there, got hired on at Avenue. Crazy. Yeah. So that was started at Avenue in 2006. Hmm. And so when you start, what is the 2006? So what's yeah. actually happening then? So when, for me. So it was just booming. Like the city was, going crazy. Just, it was just going bananas, yeah. right? And it was like we could barely keep up with the pace of how much content we needed to just, like it was just to, to fill it in, right? It was like, you you know, they'd say, okay, you have this many pages of editorial, yep. and then they'd come back and be like, no, you add eight more pages of editorial. And then on you to kind of go find, to go find the stories and find the people, or they give you oh, yeah. some like parameters of like, okay, we're looking for... Uh, well, you kind of know what Avenue is, right? Yeah. Like as a city lifestyle magazine, we cover home decor, fashion, food. Food's pretty much the bread and butter. Everybody eats. Everybody yeah. wants to know what's going on in the food scene. Yep. Back then too, um, style, shopping, neighborhoods, people in the city, and sort of civic issues. So not necessarily politics, mm-hmm. but those sort of pieces like – even in 2006, there, there was a huge concern with affordable housing, homelessness, a growing drug problem. Mm-hmm. So, you know, there's parts of it where you're like, oh, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Yep. One of the problems that seems to have, for a large part, kind of gone away was that at that time, there was a, there was a big group of people who really didn't feel... Like they didn't, they were here to work and that mm. was it. They had no interest in building community. They mm. were like, we're not going to... Once the job's over, whether that's a contract that's over or whether, you know, we retire, we're not going to stay here. We don't have any interest in building this city or improving this city. And we don't have any, um, whether that was actual people or whether there was a feeling that that was what people were thinking. Like, I remember there were enough Americans in the city at that time that John Kerry's sister came and campaigned for him in Calgary because there were enough people who could vote in the U.S. 
election that it was worth having a campaign stop here. Wild. Right? So I think that idea, that question of is Calgary a city worth building, that question's been resolved. Mm -hmm. There's there's not a lot of people who are here who are like, meh, don't yeah, care. Yeah, yeah. Um, or if they are here, you don't really hear from them. They're, they're, they've got other concerns. Mm -hmm. um, whereas I think there's a lot of people who are like, we need to build the city in this way, and it competes with someone else's vision of where we should build the city. Mm -hmm. But we have less concern about, can this be a world-class city? Is this a great city to live in? What do we... Is it worth investing in yeah. further? I don't think there's a lot of people being like, yeah, it's not really worth it. Mm -hmm. You have a very interesting perspective now that as I listen to this and think, because like Avenue has been, you know, at the heart of this city as, as like this um, publication that kind of, it's like the tone of the city. There's been so many stories over all these years. You've been there for a long time. So yep. I'm really curious yep. to hear about, you know, in 06 when you first start there, there's no digital. Digital is like very had, fresh. So we had a website. Uh, the website was PDFs mm. of the pages yeah, of the just, magazine. Just, oh, you just flip, flip through you, the pages. I, wasn't, I can't remember if you flipped through them, but you could like, you would have a, you know, a drop down menu yep. and it'd be like yep. food stories yep. and you'd see the collection of food stories. Social is just getting going. Facebook's like 04. Yeah. Facebook had just started. And I remember people being like, yeah, and I'm not on Facebook. I'm still not on Facebook. Yep. Um, and the company is obviously yep. Redpoint yep. Avenue yeah. have very active Facebook pages. Um, yeah, and so it's been that that rise and now maybe that crest of social media, right? Sure. Like where is that going now? I yeah. think that's actually probably been the most interesting shift in the last year is is the question of so what's where is digital going? Like mm -hmm. it is not as clear mm -hmm. as it seemed like it was maybe 2 years ago even. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Your before we started this whole podcast, we talked about a couple of things and one of them was community. Yeah. So in 06, when you're you know, when you're looking for ideas, was community being talked about? This idea of like community, you know, building community and, and you know, creating an environment to share stories. Was it was it a conversation then, or was it just this? I think it was a different type of conversation. So, with the magazine in two thousand six, I remember that a big part of the conversation in the city at that time, and, and it's interesting how much of this cycles through, right? And you're like, oh, we're back. Okay, which, we're back to this. Which is great that um, you can see that too, right? Because you can put it on the board and be like, aha. Yeah. <laughs> Well, like the city ha was going through a rebranding, right? And, then, and I can't remember exactly what years, but it's like, yeah, I think we're just about to head into another rebranding effort, right? And yeah. it's like, oh, okay, yeah, what, what happened to that one? <laughs> um, but it was, I think the, the rebranding effort that eventually resulted in be part of the energy mm -hmm. that I think started around maybe 2007, eight. Yep. Um, there was the whole push there at in 2006, seven, there was this whole idea of we need to make Calgary into a world class city. There was this like phrase world class city got used all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was um, there was also at that time you had to make the argument. You had to prove that Calgary was a stylish city. I don't think mm -hmm. you have to prove that anymore. Yep. Um, but I, I don't know if we talked about the magazine building community as much as we talked about the magazine being part of the conversation. Like, mm. where is the future of the city and how do we ensure that the magazine's part of that conversation? Mm. Um, and I think there's a shift in a sense, instead of this, the, instead of the magazine just being a curator and reflection of the city, yeah. that the, the magazine also sort of build, is part of city building. Mm. And I think that that's, an interesting conversation that's happening, not just in Calgary, but across North America, especially right now, because so many magazines and newspapers and TV stations and radio stations are deeply imperiled, right? The, 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 mo the model for pretty much all of media is broken in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And not just the business model, but the way, the ways and methods and traditions of creating information. Like, how do we know what we know? Yeah. And that idea of like, well, you interview two opposing views and that means it's true. It's like, well, that doesn't really work. And we know that there's a lot of different views and we know that there's a lot of people who have been kept out of 
the conversation mm -hmm. and have been kept out of um, what journalism is and how it views it, both in terms of being makers of, of journalistic truth, but also being sources. Mm -hmm. And so really digging into some of that work has been really important for Avenue over the past, especially five years, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. Um, whereas that was not really part of the conversation in 06, right? Like it was mm -hmm. not like you know, who are the sources? I was like, the, when you asked who are the sources, it was to try and get it, uh, make sure that you're really talking to the tastemakers yeah, and yeah. the experts. Um, but it wasn't that sense of like, what's the diversity, what's the diversity of diversities mm -hmm. that are mm -hmm. represented within our pages and uh, on the covers and in yeah. the stories and, and as writers and photographers and illustrators. Mm -hmm. Do you have um, vivid memories of stories or, or over the years, whether it's like, I don't know what your flashes, I don't know if they're covers that flash to you or like, do you have I mean, moments? there's, yeah, there's definitely, and I think especially now that I'm not day to day on the editorial. So I moved away from being the editor in chief, I think about two years ago now, maybe a little bit longer than that. And it really was, I was ready and the magazine really needed a new leader. And we we're so lucky that we've got Shelly Arnish in place and she's really leading not only the team, but the magazine yeah. and, and part of that um, change of, of really being part of what the city needs in its next iteration too. Because I think part of what's happening with the city is that change from what the city was before the pandemic and, and really before the sort of um, – decline in the oil pricing around 2014. Mm -hmm. um, Calgary's rebuilding from that, not just from the pandemic, but mm -hmm. from the changing energy sector. Mm -hmm. And it needed a new voice. But yeah, when I look back, there's certainly things where I'm like, oh, it's so neat that we got to do that. And I'm mm -hmm. so proud that we did that. Like we, you and I were talking about a cover earlier when I'm like, yeah, we painted the cover lines into the photo. Like it was a photo in front yeah. of a, 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 a window for a stampede issue. And so we had painted, done the classic you know, stampede um, window painting. But we had, you know, one year we had a Christmas issue where ATP was putting on Seussical the Musical and Dave Kelly was the cat in the hat. And so we had Dave Kelly dressed as the cat in the hat. And if you were paying attention, all the cover lines r rhymed. Okay. Right? And I'm like, <laughs> that's silly. It's really silly. I'm so proud that we got to do this really silly thing of a cover with yeah. rhyming cover lines so cool. for Christmas. <laughs> you you said that you've talked about this a few times and I find it very interesting your where you see the city and mm. how and how you see the how you've watched it kind of trans transform and move in different directions. Yeah. And, and it's interesting that you can I would have never thought. Now that I think about this on the fly, you know, you you have this um publication that has story after story after story you're hearing things over and over and over from all these different sources so you you have your pulse on what's actually like really yeah, what's happening. I mean I, I that's kind of what the job is is mm. trying to have a finger on the pulse and we we try and there's all sorts of different things that we try to do that um and part of it's being out and talking to people and you know following curiosity yeah. but we used to kind of joke too that it's like if you hear something three times that's that's real Mm. <laughs> if you hear something once, that's somebody's opinion. Yep. If you hear something twice, that's a coincidence. Yep. If you hear the same kind of idea three times, that's a real thing that you need to pay mm. attention to. So that could be anything. It could be um, somebody's talking about a uh, restaurant or if somebody's talking about yeah. a, a person or if somebody's talking about whatever. Yeah, and I think within, <clears throat> you know, Avenue is fun because we cover such a broad variety of things, right? Mm -hmm. We cover food, we cover fashion, we cover people, we talk to, uh, you know, people in sports, people yeah. in culture, people in business, people in the community, in politics, mm -hmm. in nonprofits, in medicine, in teaching, like it's just everything, yep. right? So it's the whole life of the city. And I think that there's a way in which often that kind of, the piece that Avenue does, which is lifestyle reporting, can, it's really easy to be like, that ah, doesn't really matter. Like it doesn't, it's not politics, it's mm. not news. Yep. So it doesn't really matter. But in a way, it's all the pieces of life that do matter, mm -hmm. right? And not that politics doesn't matter, but politics matters because it affects people's real lives. And um, so there's parts of it where you're like, it's that end point. Mm -hmm. It's that, you know, it's, yeah, it's not the day-to-day -day coverage of like what did council vote on. Yeah. But it's the three years down the road, this is the result mm -hmm. of where that vote, yeah. what happened there. Yeah. Um, 
your experience is starting there early. What's actually happening? What, you know, what are you going through? Are you are you crafting your your skill? Are you are you <laughs> are you uncovering something like a different direction for your your career path? Or are you just kind of like in a groove doing your thing? Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure that I totally understand your question, but I'll so, answer what I think it is, which is I don't think I'm as calculated as being like, I'm going to do this yeah. to get to there, to be able to open this door, to get to this. I'm, you know, I've been really, really lucky in that, in that many doors have been opened to me and they've had options and I've had choices of like, do you want to do this? Yeah, let's do this. Mm. Do you want to do this? No, I don't want to do that. Mm. Right. And so I, I've been really lucky and I, I wish that I was someone who's like, oh, I was, I, you know, I've just been carefully honing my craft and learning all these things so that I could be the ideal publisher. And I'm like, I'm, I'm not mm. that calculating. I'm yeah. not that, um, I'm pretty driven, but I'm not driven in the sense of being like, I'm going to do this to get to there. Yeah. It's more that I'm like, I'm already on this path and I'm enjoying it. So let's see how, see how far we can take it. Mm. Right. So a lot of the things, you know, I, I, I think even six months before we bought the company, I had declared that I was like, I don't, I don't want to be an owner. I don't want to do this. This is not my path. I'm having a great time doing what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And then it was like, you know, okay, so it's decision time. And I was like, yes, let's do this. I'm in. I'm in. Um, and I am a person who I'm fairly decisive. So once I decide that it's like, this is what we're doing, yep. then we're going to do it. Mm. Um, so I don't know if that answered your no, it question. Does, it, 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 you know, it does for, <laughs> it did for sure. I think, I think what I like, what I like to understand is just, you know, from you, you've been there for a long time and this, you've started the bottom, whatever that, whatever yeah. that looks like. And, and for whatever reason, the skill set, interest. I mean, I think a lot of it was opportunity, right? Mm. So I was hired as the assistant editor and within nine months, the editor left. Mm. And so I was like, who's going to be the editor? And the woman who was above me, who was the obvious choice was basically like, not me. Uh, so like, will, will you do it? And I came on as the interim editor yep. and then was like yeah I like this if you'll keep me I'll keep doing it and they were mm. like yeah you're you're pretty okay at this um <laughs> and that you know and then same thing that about 11 years ago or I guess it would be 10 years ago when I came back from my first maternity leave I was asked do you want to become the publisher and at that time I was like no I don't want to do that I don't like, I don't really love the business side of things. I don't, like, I, I'm okay dealing with my budget, but yeah. otherwise I don't really care. Um, and then I was just really lucky that that opportunity came up again later, mm. right? So usually if you turn down an opportunity, they're not like, well, we'll check back with you in back. five years. Mm -hmm. um, and I was lucky that they did, right? Mm. So that when that job came up again, yep. um, they were like, well, what about now? And that at that time, I was like, yes, I have done what I want to do mm. with being the editor. Um, let's take on this, this new opportunity. So it became was the publisher editor for a little while, then became the vice president of product development, and then became the president, and then through that role. And really, part of it was the opportunity all the way along that I, I just was very well supported, both by people above me, but also coworkers, yeah. that I just had... I just had so much support from within the company and from honestly from within the community. And mm. I think that's been the really eye-opening and, and really heartening thing about... Um, becoming the co-owner of, of Redpoint was that just the volume of people who've reached out to Roger and I and been like, this is great. Keep it up. Cool. How can we help you? And mm -hmm. I always try to have an answer for the question, how can we help you? Mm -hmm. So if you're listening and you're like, how can we help? Um, you know, we need, we need subscribers. We mm -hmm. need newsletter subscribers. We need print publication subscribers. And we get a lot of people who are like, well, why would I subscribe to Avenue? It's free. I can just pick it up. And that's Absolutely, 100% true. We yeah. want to try to keep it free. We want um, that information to be free to anybody in Calgary who wants it or needs it or wants to take part. Um, and we're what we're asking is for people to basically contribute. Yep. And, you know, for the price of getting it to your door instead of you having to go out and track it down, mm -hmm. um, you know, you can help us make sure that that content, those storytelling opportunities are available for and about the whole city. Yeah. 
It's a good ask. <laughs> How does this um your entrepreneurial adventure now? Yeah. You know, I It's a lot different than most people's, right? Because I didn't yeah. I'm not a founder. No, I, but I but, took over a business. But even even there's so many different ways to do it. Yeah. And I think I think some people think, well, you gotta be born into it. You know, and like your your family, you gotta have the DNA and the chops like early to pull this off. Other people, you know, they just they get fired and they gotta start their own thing. Like there's so many different ways mm-hmm. to get into this. Was it ever on your like you touched on it and said, like, I don't want I don't want to be a publisher, but yeah. like would you have ever thought in 06? That fast oh, forward no. here. That, no, no, no. Like this, this. I, I certainly, and especially, I, I never. It w- in 06, it would have been inconceivable to mm-hmm. me that I would become the owner of yep. Red Point. But also that you know, people always talk about like, oh, would you start your own magazine? It's like, no, never. <laughs> Terrible <laughs> idea. No. Um, and I think a lot of it is it looked really lonely. Mm. I think that was the big thing from where I stood. It looked, entrepreneurialism looked really lonely. And I love being part of a team. And I think that that's, that's all, there's always a tension there as an editor because the actual work you have to do on your own. You're sitting alone, looking at the words and yeah. figuring out how to, how to work, work them into the story. Yeah. And, um, but I love being part of a team and brainstorming and um, and and what entrepreneurialism looked like to me from the outside was being the lone mm. wolf, right? Where were you seeing that? In, inside the organization or the people that you're talking to, like these business owners and people? Yeah, like I think more so the business owners and people, especially through Top 40, right? We right. interview and talk yeah. to a lot of entrepreneurs. Right. It's a lot of entrepreneurs that get into that program. Yep. And... Yeah, they had their team with them, Mm -hmm. but they always were apart from the team. And the team supported the vision, but they had the vision. Mm -hmm. And it just, I think a lot of times looked like this one person on their own forging this path. And it seemed like I was just like, I don't know about that. Mm -hmm. And even when I took on the role of being the president, I I worked with a career coach, Judy Rigi, and she was fantastic in being like, you can define what this is going to be for you. You get to say what that role of being the president is yeah. and what it isn't. And same with, you know, being a co-owner. You get to decide to a certain extent, like there's legal obligations that you have, but otherwise there's you get to decide what it's going to look like day to day and and how you're going to define that role mm. and what you're going to bring to the position. And now that you have a partner. Yeah. Do you think that that the idea of that loneliness idea it's interesting now that there's potentially, you know, there's somebody beside you that you can. Yeah. And I think also the way that we've, the way that we work with the company, it doesn't, there's definitely parts of it where you're like, well, buck stops here kind of thing. Mm-hmm. But I feel, I don't feel like it's made this incredible rift between me and the rest of the team. Yeah. That if anything, it's been like, okay, we are, it's actually drawn them closer mm. to the ownership. That mm-hmm. it's like, okay, we can, we're all working on this. Yeah. We all agree on what this is. Mm-hmm. We all are working in moving this in the in the same direction. Yeah. Um, which is much bigger than Avenue, right? Like Red Point is much yeah. bigger than mm-hmm. just Avenue. And so it's also about that part of like, well, how does this fit in? And we've I think broken down some silos between the teams that were there were very good reasons for them in the past. They just don't work at the size of the company that we are now. Mm-hmm. So how did it even happen? You know, where does this conversation How did it even happen? Well, I, where, where, does it, where does it start? You know, is it is it somebody approaching you? Is it are you seeing something in the background? You're like, oh, there's some moves being made that I feel like Well, so the ownership, so Pete Graves was the owner of Red Point for yeah. about the last eleven years. And then before that it was his father, Don Graves, who was who had founded the company. Um and they they gave us this incredible legacy, right? That it's just this legacy of this company that is well known, beloved, mm-hmm. um and that they really had built that team and built that trust of the team. Um, and so we're incredibly fortunate that that exists and that yep. we, they got us through the pandemic, right? There's, there's just no way yep. um, to overstate the impact that they had through that time. Uh, and and we, Pete had been talking for a number of years about like, well, maybe there's an opportunity for co-ownership. You come in, maybe there's different things that we could look at. And we had looked at a few different things, but it had also been like, maybe someday. Like down the road, maybe we look at this. But through the pandemic too, I mean, I think Pete 
he's a serial entrepreneur, really fascinating guy, has done all, had all sorts of different companies. Um, and his passion lay in the mental health field mm. and in, you know, a startup that he was working on that was taking him to California quite a bit. Whereas Redpoint it really needed some day-to-day -day attention. It mm. needed an owner who really had a passion for that. Yeah you know, change that was happening within media, within print media, within publishing, and within the city, right? If you're yeah. a, a, a regional publisher, you have to be on the ground really thinking about how is not only the industry changing, but how is the city and the region changing? What types of coverage and what types of um, community building do we need here? Mm -hmm. And his passion had just moved on to other areas. So it, we got to a point where he was just like, ready. he was ready to sell. And we were fortunate that Roger and I were, were there when that opportunity came along and could take it on. Hmm. Um, it's really cool. It's really yeah. cool. That, it's really cool. That it's been like that long in the making, you know, that's, it's a, uh, yeah. And I mean, it's one of those things where you're like, well, like, was it 17 years in the making or like, what was it? So, mm -hmm. you know, it feels like it, you look back and you're like, oh yeah, all this was building mm -hmm. to this, mm -hmm. but there, I, I, I'm just very fortunate. I'm very lucky of, about so many things along the way. Yeah. And um, like I said, I, I don't know that it was that intentional. I certainly no. wasn't like groomed mm -hmm. for the position mm -hmm. in any way. It was just like, oh, now here's this other opportunity. Yeah. Do you want it? And I was like, like I said, even a year before, I would have been like, absolutely not. Um, and the timing was just bang on perfect yeah. for everybody. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. Um, being reflective and looking back on it, you know, it's interesting. I don't know how often you do it or if you give it much thought at all. I, I find myself looking back at just like moments in time that, mm. that I can start connecting dots to yeah. why, where I am. I definitely didn't do anything with intention. I'm like, <laughs> I'm going to move this here so I yeah. can go. I, the same way you explained it, it's, it's not, not a way. But I think this other way, I don't know what it is. Is it commitment? Is it hard work? Mm. Is it just like uh, following what you're interested in? Because all those things have led to this opportunity. Yeah. And I, I mean, I think I'm also a person who typically has like plan A, plan B, plan C. Mm. But when plan A doesn't work out and plan B doesn't work out and plan C is the one that we go with, yeah. I don't sit and ruminate and be like, oh, plan A. Like we, uh, It's like, okay, well, we're on to plan C. So let's yep. go. That's now the primary path. Like you got to move on, right? Mm -hmm. So I think it's also, again, when you're looking back, it's it's easier to be like, oh, yeah, this led to this, led to this, led mm -hmm. to this. Um, and and you just jettison all the things that didn't work out of the narrative. You're just like, oh, yeah, I don't forget those. those. <laughs> Who cares about those? Um, so, yeah, it's, um, it is interesting, too. And, and I think part of the thing that's been really interesting for me now on the business side is to realize that what I thought I didn't want was that I was like, oh, I won't be able to do creative work and it won't be creative problem solving. And it's like, it's all creative problem solving. It's all um, creative work. It's all brainstorming and multitasking and um, figuring it out as you go along. And I think when, when, at least for me, but I think a lot of people who think of themselves as creative people, assume that the business people like know what they're doing mm -hmm. in like a kind of like almost like a sciencey way mm -hmm. that it's like, oh, here's the thing about money. And it's like, actually, the thing about money is it's all made up and you're everybody's faking it. And everybody's like, let's try this. That didn't work. Let's try that. And it's not, it's very much like any other creative endeavor where you're just trying to figure it out day to day and trying to not just put out fires, but even trying to figure out like which of these fires is the biggest fire? Mm -hmm. Like which is the thing that's gonna get us when we're not looking? Mm -hmm. And that's true on, you know, editorial when you, you're trying to get a specific source and you can't reach them or you can't get them or you get them and then they don't say the thing that you thought they were gonna say. Mm -hmm. And the story has to go in a different direction. Well, it's the same, I think, from the business perspective where you're like, oh, this is going to happen. This client's going to do yeah, this and yeah, this client's yeah. going to do this. And then you're like, they didn't do those things. So what's the plan now? And, you know, like you were talking about social media, like, oh, we built up this huge Twitter audience. Oh, Twitter imploded. It's got X. <laughs> like, it doesn't <laughs> even matter. Um, and you don't own that. Mm -hmm. And so figuring out, like, 
what it what really can you control because it's very little mm -hmm. and when when something goes sideways what can you do to either get it back on track or yep. abandon that track mm -hmm. or come up with something new entirely mm -hmm. because it's usually not going to be the thing that you're anticipating it's mm -hmm. usually going to be something mm -hmm. a because if it, if you anticipated it you <laughs> do something <laughs> to get out of its way. Um, and it's those problems that just come out of left field, like Google says, we're not going to link to stories anymore. Uh, and you think, okay, well, we got to, we actually turns out we have a huge advantage because we have a physical print yeah. publication that tells yeah. people what we're doing and where to find us. Um, and our print readership is booming. Like I can't even tell you how often like I'm getting requests from people where they're like, we're out of magazines, we need more magazines. Cool. And it's just like they vanish, right? So it's a great problem to have, but it's always a problem that you don't anticipate that's going to come mm -hmm. out of, you know, left field towards you. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah, well, okay, let's figure this one out. Um, that idea of like being a creative and thinking that there's like these magical business people that have all the yeah, answers. Yeah, they have MBAs and it's, they know all the, they've learned this magical business stuff somewhere. It's a, it's a real. It's a deterrent for a lot of people, yeah, I it, think. Like it occupies brain power for me too. Like I think before I start doing my yeah. own thing, you're like, eh, do I like. Do I, can I do that? I'm not, I'm Am not, I allowed? I'm not this. And I think part of it is too, and this is what I've learned a lot, is that you're a business person by being doing a business. Mm. That's how you become a business person is that mm. you, you start or run or operate or buy a business and then voila, you're a business person. And that's kind of how you become a journalist. Like a journalism is not a profession. There are a lot of people who have journalistic credentials and they've gone to school for journalism and they have a degree in journalism. And that's great. Yep. And there are a lot of people who are journalists who do not have that. Mm. And you just are a journalist by doing journalism. Mm. And if you do it well enough for long enough, you get to say you're a journalist. And if even actually if you do it long enough but badly, they'll let you say you're a journalist. Um, it's not like being a dentist. Like you don't need to be licensed by a board of journalists. Yeah. You just get to do it. Mm -hmm. um, and which is always kind of what struck me about there's this tension between journalists and bloggers. And like, it's the same thing in a different spot. Mm -hmm. And the biggest thing I think is different between those two is having an editor, right? That if you have an editor, you have a second person or a yeah. second group of people who comes along and is like, you can't write it like this. Um, you get a different kind of product. But mm -hmm. that's the difference, not the like the medium mm -hmm. or the opinion or mm -hmm. the background or you know, licensing of the yep. person who's doing it. And I've, I, what I'm finding is that that's the same with business is you're a business person if you run a business and if you mm. run the business well, then you're a good business person. And if you run the business poorly, <laughs> you don't get to be a business person for very long. <laughs> and that's really the difference, right? Is yeah. that there's no like licensing board of businessmen mm -hmm. who comes along and like stamps your card and you mm -hmm. get to keep going. You just get to keep going if you have the willpower and sometimes the financing. Yeah. I love, I love, I loved how you just put that. Like in my mind, I'm like, oh, I can't believe she said that. Cause it's so, it's so perfect. And I think part of this is that that idea of these conversations aren't had all the time. You know, people are looking at these, you need your MBA. You need to like to be this magical business person. You need to have a bunch of things, but the other options, you just, you just do, do it. it. <laughs> and, then, and then you are it. <laughs> and I mean, I think there's certainly, there's types of business where you do like you need a yep. you need a license yep. to sell real estate. Mm -hmm. You need a license to work. You know, or, I, I'm pretty sure you need a license to be a banker, yep. right? There's certain things where it's like you need to know how to do this. Yes. And what's interesting about being an entrepreneur whose entrepreneurial journey started by taking over a company. That's the first time I've ever. Hmm. Right, I ran a paper route. That's not even necessarily really. It's just being a very underpaid contractor, I guess. <laughs> but um, I never. I never really was an entrepreneur before that. Yeah. And I started by like, okay, you've got 25 employees and but payroll's already worked out and you have a business license number and you have GSTs all th that's done and mm -hmm. there's like a real accountant who knows what she's doing and does have licensing. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness. Um 
that's all done. Yeah. Like all, there's so many things that I talk to other entrepreneurs about and they're like, oh, trying to figure out payroll taxes. And I'm like, skipped that. Um, so it's a very different journey for me because yep. it's already started and I had a core team who are fantastic mm -hmm. and we had all the like, the processes ex existed. Yep. It was just about refining them and continuing to refine them. And we even had processes about how to refine the processes. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think that part of it of being like, oh, it's the same kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's the same as when becoming the editor of Avenue. Yep. Like I just it kind of in some ways fell into it that it was like, well, this is available. Nobody else seems to want to do it. Um, and I remember, and I've told this story before, but when I became the editor of Avenue, it, it was like, I think I spent the first two months there. I'd come in every day, put my stuff on my desk and excuse myself and grow throw up because I was like, I can't do this. And somebody's going to notice that I can't do this and ask me to stop doing it. And basically they never noticed or never bothered to ask me to stop. And 17 years later, it's kind of the same thing where it's mm -hmm. like, you know, scare yourself a little bit each day. Um, not so much that you can't sleep so that you can't get back up the next day and be scared. Mm -hmm. it's, <laughs> it's, it's right. It's, like I agree. You're, yeah, I'm sure I you're agree. in the same position where it's like, yep. There's things I th I would suspect that even the people who have the NBAs and have all the credentials and have been told they're allowed to be business people, there's things that come up where they're like, oh, I don't know what to do about that. For sure. Um, because most of it isn't the problems that come up aren't in the books. Yeah. They're totally new. Mm -hmm. Or they're a variation, or they or they're the same, but they look different on the surface or yeah. something, right? That yeah. it's just like, I don't know. Figure it out. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, this has been awesome. Thank you. I, um, it's just so cool to hear the different ways to get to these different places. You know, there's just, that's the cool thing about the show, I think, which I, I really like. It's just, there's just so many different ways to get yeah, to a paths. spot. Exactly. And I think what's really cool is just hearing the stories behind, you know, how you got there. Yeah. Um, I end the show with one question. Okay. When I say Calgary, where's your head go? This is a giant one for you. So. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's the question yeah. that I ask myself every day, right? That's the main part of our job is what is Calgary? What it, can it be? What is it? What does it need? Um, and I think, uh, where does my head go when you say Calgary? I, I think Calgary is still a question. I think mm. it's a delightful question to keep asking. Mm. Um, and so that that's, it's not, my head doesn't go to one spot. It makes, it makes sense. It just for keeps, it's, it is the main question of mm. my career is Calgary. <laughs> it's so, <laughs> I was, I was going to ask you another question before that one. I'm like, no, I'll just ask, I'm going to ask that one, but it's, you're in such an interesting spot. Thank you. Just like being like, I think the biggest change for us through the pandemic in terms of that question of Calgary mm -hmm. is not just what's Calgary for and who's it for, but now it's what are cities even for? Mm. Because as we come out of the pandemic and so many people are living their work lives differently and they want different things out of their career and they want different things out of what a city provides to them or doesn't, that they're just like, I'm opting out, I'm moving to Okotoks or I'm yep. moving to Sri Lanka or wherever yep. it is. Yep. Um, there's so many people who have options now that they didn't have before. And I think that's one of the continuous models of modern life, right? Is like opportunities opening up for people who didn't have opportunities mm -hmm. before. And those opportunities inherently change what cities are and what they can be. And I think the biggest question that we have that's new is, what are cities going to be for mm -hmm. in the future? They, for the past you know, 50 years maybe, they were for commerce. You went to a city, you moved to a city so that you could get a better job. You moved your business to a city so that you could sell more stuff to a bigger market. Mm -hmm. But now you can sell more stuff online and you can buy that stuff online and you can work online and you can do all these things. But people are social. People wanna be around other people. 
But the reason that they want to be around other people is probably going to change. Mm -hmm. And who we mean by other people is changing. So instead of being about accommodating diversity, which cities have been struggling with for the past many years, I think the cities of the future are going to be about attracting diversity. How can we attract Mm. the widest diversity of um, backgrounds, of education Mm -hmm. levels, as Mm -hmm. well as types? Um, How can we accommodate, uh, accommodate, attract and retain neurodivergent people? How Mm -hmm. can we attract um, just all sorts of ways of living in this city? Mm -hmm. And so that it becomes less about accommodating Mm -hmm. and more about building a city that's for a variety of people. Yeah. (laughs) That's the the perfect way to end this. (laughs) It's, um, yeah, I think it's going to be, I'm excited to watch what you you and your partner are going to do with this. Yeah, we're excited. And it's going to be really interesting just to, now that I have a glimpse of, you know, what, what makes you tick and like, just the Calgary focus. Yeah. It's going to be fun for me to watch how you guys make decisions and where you push this and, and what comes up. So Yeah. Well, we hope, we hope your listeners come along with the ride for, with us too. Um, you know, sign up for the newsletters, sign up, get a subscription, become yep. a member of Avenue yep. um, and, and help us figure it out. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks for your time. Thank you. I know you're really busy, so I uh, appreciate you doing this. <laughs> Thank thanks. you.